we not only need to hear from missionaries during our Missions Emphasis Month, but we need to hear from people who have been there, who aren't necessarily missionaries, and how it has changed their lives. So, Brother Dan, why don't you come and share with us? Let's pray this morning. Jesus, speak to our hearts today as we discover how to live, how to give, and how to go. Lord, we need you so badly. Pray that you would be with us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, the apostles and those that were with them completely changed their way of life. They were committed to a few things. They were committed to hearing teaching from the scriptures. They were committed to hanging out with each other. They had dinner together, and they prayed together. Uh, those are great things. Like, these are, these are, this is scriptural. Hanging out with each other is scriptural. It's of the Lord. Meeting together and hearing the preaching of the word, that is of the Lord. Eating together, having fried chicken, and going down to Dickie's Barbecue. I mean, these are all things uh, that are in scripture. And the crazy thing is the result of this. The result of people being with each other and having everything in common was they had favor of everyone. In verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Following that, people were saved. People were added to their numbers. Uh, when I was in Cairo, I was uh, able to be part of a team of workers there, and uh, one of their core values is abiding in Jesus, and they call it their abiding time, and I had never really heard this term before January, uh, and really what it is is they are expected to spend, get this, two to two and a half hours every morning with Jesus, every morning, praying, just being reading the word, worshiping, playing the guitar, sitting and listening to music, meditating on the wonderful things that Christ has done for them. And, uh, you know, the Bible says, out of the uh, abundance of the heart, right, as we set our hearts towards what God would have for us, as we align ourselves with his purposes, and we can do this through abiding in him and being with him, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the wallet gives, the heart does, the body does. All of these things are an outflow of what he has done for us in our time with him. They don't start any meetings before 10 in the morning. They make time, and it's not so they can sleep in. They make time to be with Jesus. They're also expected to spend considerable time just being in their neighborhood, making friends, building uh, they, are, they don't live in a, a compound in Egypt. They live in various parts of the city, and they're expected to make friends and be with others. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So, we need to ask ourselves the question, are we living in Christ-centered community? And you are all here today. We're living in Christ-centered community. Uh, are you hanging out with each other outside of Sunday mornings, 10 to 11.30? Do you go with each other places and be with each other? Do you pray with each other? Are you truly sharing Christ-centered life with each other? Those can, those can be kind of the easy questions to ask in this type of environment, but the harder questions and the more important questions are this. Do you have favor with people? Do you have favor with your boss? Are you a, a model employee? Do you have favor with your coworkers? How about your neighbors? Do you know your neighbors? Are you being with them? Is the outflow of your relationship with Christ flowing into building a relationship. How about the cashier at Giant or Redner's or the people at Rita's? Are they experiencing out of you what Christ is doing in your life? And then are people being saved? Does every conversation you have point to Jesus? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I guess I'm not sorry because that's, that's a tough question for me too. Are my conversations pointing to Jesus? Man. I want to show you uh, a place uh, on the screen. This is Malia. 
This is uh, the, one of the places that I went this summer in May. And uh, Malia is six and a half square miles that is part of Spain, and it's notched out of Morocco. So this is in North Africa. I want to back out the map just a little bit and show you. So this is kind of, uh, you can see Malia where it was kind of on that horn right there. Let's back out again. You can see we're starting to see the borders of Morocco. And one more time, this is where Morocco is on the top part of Africa. So Malia is this, this little postage stamp sized area in Morocco that is technically part of Spain. And there I met a friend and his name is Caesar. And Caesar is the pastor of the only evangelical church in Malia. Now, one of the uh, incredible things about Malia, they pride themselves in, in having four religions all living together in perfect harmony. Hindus, Jews, Catholics, and Muslims. You know something that's missing off that list, right? Evangelical Christians are not even recognized as anything in Malia. And uh, my friend Caesar uh, lives his faith each and every day in that country. Caesar, uh, it's, it's a very small place, like I said, six and a half square miles, and Caesar is very well known as the pastor guy. He walks around the streets. We, we were there for, uh, it was, we were there for four hours, and we're driving around in this big yellow Volkswagen van, and uh, Caesar's yelling out the window at people, eh, yelling in Spanish, talking to them, whatever, and we're looking at him like, this guy's like a celebrity here. So we asked him, we said, well, Caesar, do you know a lot of people? Do you typically see a lot of people out on the streets? He goes, no, no, this is, this is irregular. I, I, don't, I hardly ever see people around. And we were there for six days. And every single day, Caesar would see five, ten people. And he would talk to them. And he would ask how they were doing in their lives, what was going on. And as they left, he would say, yeah, I've been inviting that guy to church for seven years. That guy used to come to my church. I think something's going on at home and all of these kinds of things. We would meet uh, people at cafes, and he would strike up conversations uh, with waitresses and waiters. Uh, there was one waiter we went, uh, now this is Spanish culture. I don't know if you're familiar with Spanish culture. Uh, everything starts a little bit later in the day, kind of life begins at 10, 11 in the morning, around 2 or 3 in the afternoon. You take like a two-hour cat nap, a siesta. Um, it's awesome. It's totally scriptural. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then you kind of go about your day, you go back to work or whatever, and then you have dinner like around 10.30, 11.30 at night. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, and we were not quite used to that. So one night we're, uh, we're having dinner. It's around uh, 11.30. We went to a, a cafe, and we're outside, and we're having dinner. And Caesar strikes up a conversation with our waiter. And um, the waiter is Muslim, and his father is a professor of philosophy at a university in Morocco. And so he starts talking to him, and he starts asking him about his faith journey. And um, he, this guy, he's, <laughs> he was 19 years old, 19 going on 45. He had done everything. He, was, he knew exactly what he wanted out of life, and uh, he had answers to every question that Caesar was asking him. And uh, so Caesar started asking him some very difficult questions about joy and about peace and about if he really knew what his life was all about. And, and he got very defensive, and he said, well, you should be asking my father these questions. He's the pr professor of philosophy. And um, so he, he went back into the restaurant. Now, we had found out at this time, this was like 12.30, 12.45 in the morning, and we're all falling asleep at the table. And... Uh, we, we found out that the restaurant had actually closed like 45 minutes prior, but he had kept the restaurant open for us so he could continue having this conversation. And as we were about to leave, we were crossing uh, the street to the parking lot, and the waiter came out of the restaurant, and he ran across the street, and he gave Caesar this big, warm embrace and thanked him for the conversation. And I really believe that those things, if we're open, if we're ready, if we're willing to let our faith flow out into our conversations and, and not be so afraid. What are we afraid of? People are going to reject us? Oh, well. God is doing a work in people's hearts. And it's our responsibility to 
talk to people and let them know that Jesus loves them and that we do too. And that's really what it is. Now, it's difficult to do these kinds of things in the U.S. When I came back, when I've come back from each of these trips, I've had kind of a reverse culture shock. Right? You come back, you go to a place like Cairo where um, it's dusty and it's disgusting and there are more cars per square inch than you've ever seen in your life and a place where people are constantly on the streets. And I don't mean like you're picturing like New York City on the streets. I mean people are hanging out on the streets, right? Walking down the street in Cairo. And you see a group of people kind of sitting on the side on a stoop right now. In New York City or Philadelphia, you see people sitting on a stoop over here. What do you do? You look straight ahead. You do not make eye contact. And you go. And you've got a place to be, right? Now, walking down the street in Cairo, people sitting right there. You look over, kind of smile and wave. They open up, hey, hey, they want to practice. They know three English words. They want to practice. They want to shake your hand. They want to know what's going on. They want to, you know, I, I had a camera because I do video stuff. And they want to connect with you. They want to hang out with you. They want to share life with you. It was such a reverse culture shock coming back to the United States and going outside. I live in a townhome community and going outside and looking. And it's the middle of the day and tumbleweeds are going by. No one's out. It, it's a shock. So, now, for us as Christians, what do we do? What do you do when you're not working? Go home? Okay. What do you do on the weekends? Go home. Come to church on Sundays. Then what? Are you in a position where you can meet people who aren't Christians? Where do people go? Oh, yeah, uh, Dan's coming in, coming in like a tornado telling you, yeah, let's go to bars. Let's go to bars. That's where people are, right? Not necessarily. But where are you going? My, my wife and I have been convicted of this many times. We work at Valley Forge Christian College. We go home. I know one unsaved person, Lou, at Giant in Phoenixville. And we have had this conversation many times. How are we going to get out of our little bubble and meet people? Do we need to join a bowling league? Do we need to go to Starbucks and just sit there and in, not, not like sit there in your own little corner at your table for two? Do we need to go there and meet people and talk to people and go to the same restaurant multiple times and develop a rapport with that waitress, with that waiter, with that barista? We need to be intentional, folks. We have to do it because people are not going to be touched unless they know that you care. They don't, what's it saying? People don't care uh, what how much you know until they know how much you care. We have to make those connections with people. And when you abide in Jesus, the natural result is that people are pointed to Jesus with your life. Giving. After the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, they adopted a communal life. I am not suggesting that we all move into a gated community like David Koresh. That's probably too old. Sorry, kids. You should look it up on YouTube sometime. It's terrible. But this communal life that they adopted was centered on giving. They sold all of their property and possessions. Yikes. They gave to anyone in need, not those who pre-qualified for 0.9 APR. They met at the temple every day. And see, all of these things are totally in line with our theology of giving, right? Uh, you guys know that God owns it all, right? Uh, Psalm uh, 50.10, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns everything. You own nothing. You own nothing. Congratulations. God owns it all. He has given us things to take care of. It's called stewardship, right? The things that you have. Maybe you're saying, well, I, I really, I legitimately don't have anything. You have something. You've been entrusted with 525,600 minutes, right? You've been, you've been entrusted with time. You've been entrusted with resources. We live in one of the richest countries in the world. Even the poorest of us have more than probably 90% of the humans on the planet. God owns it all. We are entrusted to take care of a portion of it. And see, 
my uh, one of my former professors and my former pastor, Daniel McNaughton, he, he does it like this. He holds out his hand like this, and he calls it living with an open hand. Right? When you live with an open hand, you acknowledge whatever's in my hand is not mine. Right? When we, when we close down our fists like this, mine. Mine. Like the seagulls on Finding Nemo. It's mine. Right? But when we live with an open hand, we can believe that whatever's in here, this is not mine. It, it's, it's open. I, I am giving this up. And see, God can do more with an open hand than he can with a closed fist. Right? So if we live like this, we believe that God can do things through us. I don't own it. But God, if you will pass resources through my hand, your work will be done. Right? And, and the amazing thing is, when you do live with an open hand, we are blessed to have God's provision pass through us. That's what it's all about. It's all about being able to see amazing things happen when you didn't even think it was possible. I, I, I can't give that much, God. I don't know if you're doing faith promises. Right? Faith promises where you, you, you commit and say, okay, well, with God's help, I'm going to give this much. Oh, it can be wild. Right? God tells you, I want you to give $5,000 this year. <laughs> yeah, right. right. I mean, I've heard stories of people. They, they feel like, okay, well, uh, we, our family, we can give $5,000, and God says, give 10. What? Is there anyone else up there I can talk to? <laughs> right? <laughs> but see, it's not, the amounts don't matter, really. If God tells you to give the $3 you have in your pocket, that's what God's telling you. Because amounts don't matter, but believe this, motives do. Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? Right? Those are like curse words in Christian homes. So let me give you the background. Ananias and Sapphira, married couple, they sold their property. They were doing what all of the, the apostles were doing, what all the people were doing, right? Sell your property, and, and everyone puts all their stuff together in one big pot, and then we provide for everybody else, right? Except for here's what Ananias and Sapphira did. They sold their property and gave some of the money to do God's work. They gave some. They knew. They, they were in the loop. They knew that God had called them to give it all. But they didn't completely trust the Lord. So they said, you know what, let's, let's keep some of this behind. They were selfish. And they lied. Now Peter gave them an out. <laughs> Yet he said, Ananias, how is it? Now, mind you, they, they still gave money to the Lord's work, right? Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Zing. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? Okay, Pete, my bad, right? Ananias gets a tongue lashing from Peter. Can we, can we just be friends now? False. You know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Struck dead. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you. But what I'm saying is, it's not the amount that matters, right? They gave some. The condition of your heart, your motives. What are your motives for giving? We don't give to receive again. We give to see God work through us. The blessing of the Lord that comes from seeing him work through your resources, however meager they are. So how do we give? There are really three ways that we give, and we talked about one already this morning with our tithes and offerings, right? Required giving. This is out of our obedience to God. We recognize that he owns it all anyway, and we give back a portion to him. Generally accepted is 10%. Is that, is that a, a rule that you're going to be struck dead like Ananias and Sapphira? No. But it's an acknowledgement that God owns it all. We give our first fruits to him. Responsive giving. Giving to respond to a need. Uh, now, we, may, we do this, right? Someone comes up here and says, hey, I'm doing this project. And Convoy of Hope comes into town. And we say, you know, I want to get behind that. I want to respond to that need. Luke 6, 29 through 30 says, if someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. 
Responsive giving may involve you to give something up to meet a need that you were impressed with, right? These days, you hear preachers talk about, well, there may be one, one less latte a week, and you could see children fed in Africa. Well, that's true. What about something that's a little more uh, important than a latte? Responsive. And then revelation giving. These are, uh, we can consider our faith promises, revelation giving. When God impresses upon you the thought to give more than your known resources, This is the ultimate in living with an open hand. God, I can't give this without you, but only in your provision. Mathematically, this doesn't work. But when we acknowledge that God owns it all, man, he can do amazing things. With my friend Caesar in Malia. Now, Caesar, I I didn't mention this. He uh, went to Malia 10 years ago on a missions trip. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to come back and I want you to live here and be a missionary. Now, um, I won't give you all of the details of Caesar's story, but I will tell you this. Normally, missionaries go around and they do what's called itineration. They raise their budget so that they can go and live and have their needs provided for uh, in another country. Caesar, uh, his support fell through. He was from Times Square Church in New York City. All of his support fell through. So he he didn't sell everything. He gave everything away and hopped on a plane to Malia. No support from the States. Nothing. God has provided for his every need. He has a new church building. He has land in this landlocked six and a half square mile country. He has a church building. He has two vehicles, three vehicles, Two church vans and a car. He has an apartment. He eats every day. He's taking care of others, and he has no idea where it's coming from. When I was there with him, I was with my team. It was myself and five others in North Africa. We were given uh, a budget for expenses. We were part of a a media missions experience called Go Borderless. And this was uh, where people from around the world came. We did uh, some training in video production. And then we went to three countries. We went to Slovakia, Slovakia, France, and Malia, North Africa. And we were there. Uh, We had a budget for expenses. When we got there, got to the hotel, the hotel had already pre-authorized my, uh, my credit card for the hotel rooms, and I had been given cash for, uh, for all of our expenses. So um, I, I had several hundred euros now in my hand that I could do nothing with. It was a little bit frustrating. Can't you guys, like, unauthorize the card? Like, I've got cash right here. I'd really not want to have to do that. There was no way they could do that. They had authorized it like two weeks before. So I, I'm like, God, now i got to go find a bank somewhere and lose money on the exchange and this and that. While we were there, uh, Caesar, we, we were going with him on some errands, and he shared with me that he wasn't sure how God was going to pay his rent that month, how God was going to pay his rent that month. He said, oh, maybe my friend from New Jersey will call and tell me that he's going to send me a check. Um, it's re- it was really difficult because uh, the first of the month fell on a Friday, and so it, it, he didn't have the, the weekend and the service at his church and those kind of things. And God spoke to me, told me to pay his rent. Now, I've got to tell you, it stings a little bit. I would not have been able to pay Caesar's rent had the hotel not pre-authorized my credit card two weeks prior, and I had all these euros that I didn't know what to do with. And I'm thinking, how am I going to, I'm going to lose money getting this back into my account. And God says, no, 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 you're going to lose it all. And it's going to be awesome. And so the day we left, I was able to pay Caesar's rent. And, you know, <laughs> You, pick, you picture it like this moment, like the, the piano starts playing, right? And it's like days of our lives, you know, the candles and the lens flare. And you go up and you're like, God wants me to end the piano. And we don't know where that guy came from. And, and, and I went in and I asked him how much he needed for his rent. And he, he told me, he's like, well, you know, I need this or, or that. And I, I just gave him the, the higher of the two amounts. And I gave it to him. And it wasn't like this big moment where he was like, oh, he starts looking, thank you. He's like, thank you. I knew God would provide. 
Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Man, when we can let God flow through, I didn't, I didn't have a chance to tell my wife that we did that. My apologies. Told her later, by the way, we paid Caesar's rent. <laughs> but when, when it comes to giving, we need to remember that God owns it all. Believe that he will direct you as to what you're supposed to give. Live with an open hand and enjoy the ride, folks. And remember, God always provides. Always. He is our provider. And sometimes, abiding in Jesus, giving, his, uh, giving to his work results in the need to go. One year ago, I'm not making this up, one year ago, it was not on my radar to take any mission trips in 2013. None. I was planning on staying in the States for an entire year. Um, the director of international media ministries came to visit me at the college one day, and he mentioned that he was looking for a couple of guys to go to Cairo to film a documentary. And immediately, I am not making this, immediately, he's asking me, like, if I have any top-notch students that can go. And immediately, in my, in my heart, I said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I had no idea what I would be doing. I had no idea how God would provide a way for me to get to Egypt. I never, in my wildest dreams, thought I would get to see the pyramids. And um, I, I really had to have blind faith that God would provide for the details. I, said, I, told, I told him at lunch, I said, Jerry, uh, I know I, I don't really want to jump the gun too much, but um, I'd like to talk more about going to Cairo. This was six weeks before I left. Um, so I went with a, a friend and a coworker, and we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. I've never in my life experienced so much spiritual formation in my own life. I've never experienced spiritual uh, warfare like I have being in an environment like that. Like, can you imagine being in a land five times per day, bullhorns from around, from towers around the entire city. There are 4,000 what are called minarets on top of 4,000 mosques all around the city at the same time every day they blast out a call to prayer that by its very meaning rejects the divinity of Christ. Whew, that'll give you goosebumps. I was able to be there and follow these nine students around and see how God was going to use them that year. I ended up producing a 17-minute documentary. If you'd like to see it, um, I'm going to show you a part of it today, just about three minutes from it today. But uh, if you'd like to see it, I can tell you where to go online to find it. You'll need a password because it is relatively sensitive. But because I said yes to Cairo, God shaped my heart. He showed me what it was like to abide in Jesus. He showed me what it was like to give up everything. To do his work. Not that I had to give it up, but the people that were giving up, that were coming to this country for a year or indefinitely with three suitcases, with two Rubbermaid tubs. That is their life. No idea where we're going to live. No idea what we're going to do. We know we're going to study Arabic. We know we're going to make Egyptian friends. That's it. Because I said yes to Cairo, the door opened to go to Spain and to go to Malia. And these trips have completely changed the course of my life, 100%. Trips overseas to be a part of what God is doing are n not only about what God wants to do through you, but also what God wants to do in you. 